Everything I do turns into a disaster. I guess I really don't know what Christmas is. Christian Church. Uh, today we celebrate the third Sunday of Advent, also known as Gaudete Sunday, from the Latin word Gaudete, meaning rejoice. On this Sunday, we rejoice in the nearness of the celebration of Christmas. Note that the third candle on the Advent wreath is rose-colored. Rose signifies joy. Christian joy goes beyond a mere emotion. The joy we have in Christ can remain regardless of what challenges we face in life. That is because we know God is in control of our circumstances. We can rejoice always and in all circumstances give thanks because we have hope in God. Following God's will and allowing his grace to transform us leads to true happiness. Let us therefore seek him, trust him, and obey him to find the deep joy that can only be found in God. Today, we will also hear about the coming of John the Baptist and his announcement of the Messiah. This gospel makes clear that John is not the Messiah, but came to prepare the way for Jesus the Christ. His role was to help the people to be ready for the Messiah. John acknowledged the greatness of Jesus and announced his coming, calling the people to repent so their hearts would be ready to encounter God in the flesh. In a similar way, we are called to prepare our hearts during Advent through repentance as we prepare to encounter Christ in Christmas. Announcements today. Um, we, are, uh, we continue to uh, host Bible study on Zoom during the month of December. Uh, so please join us on Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. or Thursdays at 8 p.m. Both sessions are the same. Uh, choose whichever suits your schedule. Um, if you don't have a link, you can email Catherine at our office. Uh, the poinsettia orders are available, forms are available today. You can also donate to Church World Service to purchase blankets or tools for needy families. Uh, please have your orders submitted today. And we're hosting a number of Christmas events over the next several weeks. Today we had the children's Christmas performance at 1015. That's available on, on Facebook. So if you missed it and would like to, to look at it or would like to look at it again, please go to Facebook. Uh, also, directly after this service, we will be doing Christmas carol caroling to our shut-ins. Uh, we'll be leaving in the church bus. I think Ed is driving. Is that right? Amos is driving. Amos is driving. Okay. I had... Yeah, everybody's welcome to go, so we'll we be leaving the church right after this service uh, to go caroling. So please join us. Also, um, there's a choir Christmas program next uh, Sunday uh, at 7 p.m. And a longest night service on the 22nd, that's a Wednesday, at 7 p.m. 
And Christmas Eve services, we're sponsoring two. We have one at 5 p.m. and one at 9 p.m. And then the day after Christmas on the 26th, we will be having a family Christmas service here uh, at 9 a.m. at during the 9 a.m. service. Uh, and more details can be found in the newsletter. Uh, let's see, are there any other announcements? So please, uh, please join us in our opening song, uh, Christians. Uh, All Your Lord is Coming um, can be found in the Pew Bibles, number 136. We're doing verses 1, 2, and 4. in the responsive reading for the Advent candle lighting as the candle is lit. Proclaim the mercy of the one who comes as one of us. The Lord is our strength and our salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of peace. The Lord is our strength and our salvation. Hallelujah. Our prayer and concern list is uh, found in the bulletin. Um, We have uh, a key prayer list. Uh, Caritha Lockridge is uh, a former member of TCC. Uh, She was an intern and uh, she's currently interim minister at Fairview Christian. Um, She needs our concerns. Uh, Becky Rosser, who is uh, um, doing much better but uh, continues to need our prayers and concerns, Pat Couch and Bernie Miller. For the ongoing prayer list, uh, we have Wanda Gardner, Jacob Cassidy, Paul Childress, Joyce Sneed, Kim and Danny Brooks, Walker Hill, Carolyn Miller, Kim Miller, 
Freddie Padilla, Dana Kidd, Judy Thompson, Vicki Willis, Becky Truxell. Do we have any others today? First, let's remember the First Christian Church of Mayfield, Kentucky, and the people of Mayfield. The people of uh, Mayfield, Kentucky, uh, their town was obliterated uh, yesterday uh, or the day evening before uh, with uh, very rare December tornadoes. Um, I'd also like to mention uh, one other friend of ours, uh, Wanda uh, Brooks Crocker, lost her husband on uh, Thursday. Uh, he was only 59 years old. They own and run the uh, Acorn Lodge. And uh, it was a very uh, um, sudden uh, death for her husband, Robert. So if you can join me in prayer, please. Oh, almighty God, gracious provider and giver of life, we anxiously await the celebration of the birth of your son, Jesus Christ. Like the people of long ago, our ancestors in faith, we too are in need of light, in need of direction, in need of your word to show us the way and to tell us what to do. Our busy lives and the consumerism that surround us make it difficult to recognize your kingdom and to hear your voice. Help us, Lord, to focus on you. Amen. Please join me in the, the Lord's Prayer. Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Luke 3, 7. Then John said to the crowds who came to be baptized by him, You children of snakes, who wanted you to escape from the angry judgment that is coming soon? Produce fruit that shows you have changed your hearts and lives. And don't even think about saying to yourselves, Abraham is our father. I tell you that God is able to raise up Abraham's children from these stories. The axe is already at the, at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be chopped down and tossed into the fire. 
The crowds asked him, What then should we do? He answered, Whoever has two shirts must share with the one who has none, and whoever has food must do the same. Even the collectors come to be baptized, and they said to him, Teacher, what should we do? And he replied, Collect no more than you are authorized to collect. Soldiers asked, What about us? What should we do? He answered, Don't cheat or harass anyone and be satisfied with your pay. And then responses to John, the people were filled with expectation and everyone wondered whether John might be the Christ. John replied to them all, I baptize you with water, but the one who is more powerful than me is coming. I'm not worthy to loosen the strap of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The shovel he uses to sift the wheat from the husks is in his hands. He will clean out his finishing area, threshing area, and bring the wheat into his barn. But he will burn the husks with a fire that can't be put out. With many other words, John appealed to them, proclaiming good news to the people. And then Isaiah 12, God is indeed my salvation. I will trust and won't be afraid. Yes, the Lord is my strength and my shield. He has become my salvation. You will draw water with joy from the springs of salvation, and you will stay on that day. Thank the Lord. Call on God's name. Proclaim God's deeds among the peoples. Declare that God's name is ex exalted. Sing to the Lord who has done glorious things. Proclaim this throughout all the earth. Shout and, and sing with joy, city of Zion, because the Holy One of Israel is great among you. No, I'm not doing the sermon. I was asked to insert something new in this morning. <clears throat> I have gotten something off the internet by a Jason Swarovski. As a writer and musician, he strives to communicate in a way that is insightful, meaningful, relevant, and mindful of the small things that we may otherwise overlook in our everyday lives. He effectively taps into his experience as a worship pastor, classroom teacher, husband, <clears throat> and homeschooling father of five to re relate stories from real life experiences. So this is from him. This week, a Charlie Brown Christmas aired on a national prime TV station for the 50th time. In a world where the latest and greatest technology is outdated, in a matter of months, and social media tends to trends come and go in a matter of days, 50 years of anything becomes quite meaningful. I'm a fan of all things nostalgic and all things Christmas, and so when the two are combined, I am hooked, and the Charlie Brown Christmas special falls squarely into that category. I was in the first grade back when they still performed Christmas pageants in schools, less than 50 years ago, but still a long time. And our class performed a version of the Charlie Brown Christmas. Since I was kind of a bookworm and already had a blue blanket, I was asked to take the part of, play the part of Linus. I memorized Luke 2, 8 through 14, and that scripture has been hidden in my heart ever since. Christina, or Ann, will you play the video? Everything, Everything I do turns into a disaster. disaster. I, guess I guess I really don't, don't know what Christmas, Christmas is all about. about. Isn't, Isn't there anyone who knows, who knows what Christmas, Christmas is all about? about? Sure, Charlie, Charlie Brown, Brown, I can tell you what Christmas is all about. about. 
Lights, Lights please. And there, and there were, were in the same, same country shepherds, abiding, abiding in the field, keeping, keeping watch over their flock by night. By night. And lo, the, the angel of the Lord came upon them. The glory, the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God, and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That's, that's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. Bob, but while working so diligently to learn those lines, there's one important thing I didn't notice then and didn't notice until now. Right in the middle of speaking, Linus drops his blanket. Charlie Brown is best known for his uniquely striped shirt and Linus is most associated with his ever-present security blanket. Throughout the story of Peanuts, Lucy, Snoopy, and Sally, and others all work to no avail to separate Linus from his blanket. And even though his security blanket remains a major source of ridicule for the otherwise mature and thoughtful Linus, he simply refuses to give it up until this moment when he simply drops it. In that climactic scene when Linus shares what Christmas is all about, he drops his security blanket, and I am now convinced that this is intentional. Most telling is a specific moment he drops it when he utters the words, fear not. Looking at it now, it's pretty clear that Charles Schultz was saying, and it's simple and it's brilliant, the birth of Jesus separates us from our fears. The birth of Jesus frees us from the habits we are unable or sometimes unwilling to break ourselves. The birth of Jesus allows us to simply drop the false security we have been grasping so tightly and learn to trust and cling to him instead. The world can be a very scary place and most of us find ourselves grasping at something temporary for security whatever that thing may be, but essentially, ours is a world which it is very difficult for us to fear not. But in the midst of fear and insecurity, this simple cartoon image from 1965 continues to live on as an inspiration for us to seek true peace and true security in the one place he has always been can, and always can still be found. A few days ago, I wrote down some thoughts about a beautiful moment that's been hidden in plain sight for 50 years in the Charlie Brown Christmas. As a pastor, I'm thrilled at the encouragement it has given. And as a former literature teacher, I'm thrilled that it has started a firestorm of film analysis. Many of you have pointed out that at the end of the scene, Linus picks up the blanket again and has, have you ever openly wondered why did he pick it up again? After the epic blanket dropping recitation of the scripture given by Linus, in response to Charlie Brown's question, he picks that blanket up. Why would Linus pick that security blanket up after so boldly proclaiming the end to fear? <clears throat> Why does he leave the stage with that security blanket still in his hand? We first must realize that we all carry that same blanket. Just like Linus, we must stand tall in a moment of faith and conviction, a moment when scripture hidden in our hearts comes to life, and all else is flung aside as we experience and proclaim the true freedom and security that only Jesus can give. But at some point out of habit, we reach down and pick that thing right back up. Faith, while powerful, is also delicate. Linus clearly knows the truth and clearly proclaims the truth. The knowledge is there, 
and the wisdom is there, and the passion is there. So why does he pick it back up? I think the answer is strikingly clear. It is because we do the same thing. We know, we feel, we proclaim. Yet we gaze in the mirror one morning to find that tattered old blanket draped over our shoulders yet again. <clears throat> and we realize that we have become so used to it being there that we hardly even notice it. But that is not where the blanket story ends. The show ends with the Peanuts gang not just singing, but clearly and unquestionably singing in worship. Even the musical style at this point is different from anything previously heard. The obvious song chosen, the obvious song to choose here could be O Christmas Tree, the notes of which have already been playing gently in the background. But the focus is no longer on the tree. The focus has become bigger than the tree. The focus is Jesus. With this new focus, the kids instead slide effortlessly into Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Glory to God, the Newborn King. And what we are witnessing is essentially an impromptu worship service. But before any of this happens, Linus parches this blanket yet again and it lays down for good at the base of that beautiful Christmas tree. Just as we should strive, not just to lay our blanket down anywhere, but to leave it forever behind at the foot of the cross for our own God, for our own good and the good of others. Linus and friends have moved from speaking truth and hearing truth into a different place of worship where they are finally respond to the truth much like those shepherds who were instructed to fear not very long ago. It is here at the end of the show that Lioness lays that blanket down yet again, and this time he doesn't look back. What even is happening? What even is happening right now? I'll be honest, that was not planned as part of the service up until 10.52 this morning. Joyce read that as part of the mix as her in her role as worship leader this morning. And a couple of people after the children's program came to me and said, you ought to have Joyce do that again about 10.45. I thought, well, that'd be fun, but didn't really immediately think any more of it. Then I went downstairs, and Joyce was out talking with Carla about doing it. And so I said, Joyce, you want to do it again? And, and thankfully, she didn't say, absolutely not. When God moves among us, a lot of times it's going to leave us with those, what even is happening right now? You may have noticed that while Joyce was finishing up there, I opened my bulletin. Take a look at the closing hymn. Hark the Herald Angels Sing. I picked that last Tuesday just because I like the sound of it. Honestly, there wasn't a whole lot more to it than, hey, we're getting closer to Christmas, we're going to sing some Christmas songs as well as Advent songs, and Hark the Herald Angel Sing is a great song. But as Joyce was reading and talking about the kids breaking out into Hark the Herald Angels Sing, I thought, hold on a second. Is that what we're singing at the end? And sure enough, there it is. God's light is always around us. God's marvelous light is always shining. But we miss it. Because we're used to the things we're used to. Take a look at the image that's up there now, that's up on the screen. What do you notice? A manger? The, the what? The big manger. The star. The light? It's light. Two Christmas trees. What are Christmas trees doing there? 
I'm pretty sure there weren't pine trees at this table. I might be wrong. I, I, I'm not a botanist. But those seem a little bit odd. Anything else? The wise men, didn't come too early. The wise men got there a little early, y'all. Jesus was a toddler when the wise men arrived, according to the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus is not illuminated. Jesus is not illuminated. That's a little bit of a strange decision, isn't it? Maybe they couldn't get the lights just right, because right in front of them is illuminated. Or maybe the manger is going to get moved forward into the light as part of uh, on Christmas Day. I don't know. There's also snow. I don't think it snowed on Bethlehem when Jesus was born. I could be wrong again. But all of these things make their way into our understandings of Christmas. I'll be honest, over the last decade or so, I've started to wonder if to Oliver, it's always Ben Crosby's White Christmas is always going to be a bit of a weird one. Because when's the last time we had an honest to goodness White Christmas? These things become a part of the story for us, even when they're not actually there. And we just let them make their way in. And some of them are benign, there's nothing wrong with them, they're just not quite accurate. Other times, our Christmas story becomes sanitized. Sanitized by our desire for the world as it is. There's a, wor- there, there's a song, y'all know the song, Do You Hear What I Hear? The last two verses of that, I actually rewrote them because it's terrible. This shepherd boy goes to the mighty king and tells him that Jesus is born. And y'all know what happens in the Gospels when the mighty king finds out Jesus is born? It is not the mighty king standing up and being like, this is great news, everybody. He'll show us goodness and light. It's King Herod sending his soldiers to wipe out all male boys to and under in Bethlehem. But do you hear what I hear has become a favorite Christmas carol. It's one, I love the song. But it tells a sanitized version of the Christmas story. These nativity scenes also show a somewhat sanitized version, right? Anybody ever stop to think about what birth in a stable might entail? Not a silent night. Not clean and nice. And he's wrapped in swaddling clothes. It's not going to be like that. That's not the way birth goes. Certainly not in a barn. And we do it when we interact with God and with Scripture. What does repentance mean? When you hear the word, do you think of confession, of forgiveness of sins? Lord, forgive me for what I have done. That's where most of us go, and that's what we consider to be repentance. But what does John the Baptist say in the Gospel according to Luke this morning? If you have more than one coat, share it with somebody who doesn't have one. If you have more than enough food, share it with somebody who doesn't have enough food. It's not confess your sins and ask for forgiveness. It is bearing fruit for the kingdom of God, that that John the Baptist says is the mark of true repentance. To the tax collectors, he says, don't take any more than what you're supposed to take. You don't need any more. To the soldiers, he says the same thing. Don't harass, don't manipulate, don't try to get more than you're given. And the central message of John the Baptist in repentance is stop thinking that you need more than God is offering you. Stop believing that you are only what you have. As Joyce said in the reading this morning, trust in God. Trust what God has given you. What God is offering you is enough for you. And if God calls you to share it, go and share it. I love that reading this morning because it talks about fear. When you hear these words about 
giving away food, giving away coats. Who here feels a little inkling? A little uneasiness? A little fear? About not having enough? It's okay. We have to name that fear and admit that that fear exists in our hearts, in our minds, and in our lives. Because only when we admit it can we find the joy, the light of God's joy that will free us. That will free us from our sense that we have to have whatever it is. I'm not going to take John the Baptist's teaching this morning and tell you, each and every one of you, this is what you must do. I'm not going to say if you show up next week in different clothes than you're wearing this week, you didn't follow the lesson and give away all your clothes. I don't know what God's message is for each and every one of us. But God is calling us to rely more and more on faithfulness on enough and in doing so we will find freedom we will find joy we will find celebration and goodness i see it now more and more i would have hoped that becoming a minister i'd see it all the time but there are plenty of times my eyes become blinded to god's light when I get caught up in the midst of everything else that's going on and think it's got to go the way I planned on it going. But when I open my eyes, and I'll be honest, it seems to be happening here all the time. I see God's light shining, God moving, God's spirit doing in ways that I never expected that have left me saying again and again, what in the world is happening right now? God's light is shining among us constantly. Do we know the joy of God's love, of God's provision? We've all experienced it at least a few times in our lives, right? That moment, that feeling, that sense, that knowing that God is with us. Emmanuel. Let's live into that, into that joy, into that freedom, into that life, abundant. The question of do you know what I know is a question of do we live into the joy that we know in Jesus Christ, the freedom that we know in Jesus Christ. It is what Isaiah sings about in the Old Testament reading this morning. Celebrate what God is doing. It is what the children at the end of Charlie Brown sing about. The light of God shining over the people of God. Proclaiming peace and goodwill. We know it. But we need to be reminded of it. Again and again. And in knowing the joy, the freedom, and the love of God, we can lay down whatever it is we need to lay down. Offering it up in service of those who need it more than we do. Amen.
The memory of the upper room, the last supper of Jesus and his disciples, is a huge gift to us from those Christians who have come before us. The supper was in itself full of memory. It was a Passover meal after all, a reminiscence of all that Yahweh had accomplished for Israel in its escape from Egyptian slavery. And in the supper, Jesus was committing to the memory of all his disciples, then and since, the sacred actions that epitomized the sacrifice of his own flesh and blood. And he laid before them the anticipation of sharing this supper with him face to face in eternal glory. In effect, Jesus was saying to them, remember what my father did for you in the past. Remember me and what I am doing for you now. Remember what I intend to do for you and with you in the future. But for now, do this in remembrance of me. Whole books and commentaries have been written for centuries on what exactly Jesus meant by these words. Scholars of the Greek text have said this remembrance is no simple recall. It is amnamesis, a vital remembrance, a rehearsal of and participation in the sacred events of the past. To remember Jesus in the Lord's Supper is not just to recall him. It is to ratify again our covenant with him, such as he instituted in the upper room. To remember him is to enter into intimacy with the Lord who is always and will ever remember us. To remember him is to recognize that he is not distant or remote, that he's not a memory just floating or hovering over us from our past, but he is himself here with us. He is the host of the supper, a reality we need not fully explain in conceptual terms because it is a mystery of faith. That it is a mystery, however, does not make it any less real. We can talk all day about the historic theological explanations of the presence of Christ in the bread and the cup. And there are many that have accrued over the centuries. But the gospel in all of this is that Christ has made himself available to us through the fractured bread that we eat and the fruit of the vine that we drink. This is my body. This is my blood. We don't need to explain these words. We simply need to receive Christ by faith and to welcome the crucified and risen Lord into our memories and into our hearts. For it was on the night that Christ was betrayed that during supper he took a loaf of bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat of it in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He blessed it and he poured it, saying, This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of the bread and drink of the cup, we proclaim Christ's death and resurrection until he comes again. We still have not gotten fully back to normal, although it's looking beautiful in here, and I want to take a minute just to note again, thank you to all of those who helped decorate. Thank you to Kay for her beautiful paintings, which are historically accurate. Please note the wise men are still far away away when Jesus is born. Thank you, Kay. Those are so beautiful. We haven't gotten back to passing the trays, but we do still offer what we can to our church. Rick mentioned earlier the tornadoes in Mayfield, Kentucky. Week of Compassion will be on the ground. First Christian Church of Mayfield, Kentucky, a member of our denomination, 
was utterly destroyed as well as three other downtown churches in Mayfield. Week of Compassion is already in, in touch with them about how they can help. We can give to Week of Compassion as a way to respond in solidarity with those who have suffered. And we still give here so that we can respond to our neighbors who are in need together, finding ways to continue to shine the light of God's joy here in Timberlake, in Lynchburg, and around the world. Let's stand together giving God thanks for all that we have received and for the opportunity to give and sing our doxology. anyone who wants to join together with our body of Christ, whether it be by transfer of membership, profession of faith, or rededicating yourself to Jesus Christ, we invite you to come forward and do so as we sing our closing hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. This morning, we have the privilege of welcoming Ben and Tammy and Oliver officially as members of their congregation, even though we've had them for quite some time now. <laughs> <laughs> and I would like to just ask them the question. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, and have you accepted him as your personal Savior and Lord? I have. And will you place your witness with this congregation here and bear fruit for him in we this will. place? We will. And I'd extend to you the right hand of Christian fellowship.
and to you, Oliver, too. Thank you. Thank you. And now, if you'll please bow for our benediction. Go with the light of the joy of God to shine before all people. Amen. Now let's give, get out there and give them heaven, and don't forget to come, Carolyn. Let's go do some singing. <laughs>